Um, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to turn the floor over to Professor Adele Blackett, who's going to introduce, introduce our speaker today, Professor Ashwa Cooper. So Adele, over to you. Okay, lovely. Well, good morning. And uh, thank you to Professors Piper, Moyes, and Smith for co-hosting this lecture in a series that's been ongoing in our faculty since 2016 on slavery and the law. And this lecture has been a regular and much anticipated feature of property les biens. So I'm delighted and honored to welcome Professor Afua Cooper back to McGill's Faculty of Law, uh, which is on unceded territory of the Kanakahaka of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And that was also a traditional meeting ground with the Anishinaabe. And welcome her to the plenary session of this course. La Professeur Cooper, et professeur titulaire au département de sociologie et d'anthropologie sociale de l'Université Dalhousie, où elle a détenu la chaire James Robinson Johnson en études noires, et où elle a contribué à la fondation d'un programme d'études noires. La renommée professeure des études africains canadiens, qui a aussi été poète officielle de la municipalité régionale de Halifax de 2010 à 2020 et a écrit et performé les 15, 15 ships to Sierra Leone, Black Halifax Stories from Here, n'est pas étrangère à notre faculté de droit. Elle en est au moins à sa troisième invitation depuis les dernières dix ans. And in particular, we had the opportunity in the first uh, visit uh, to the Slavery and the Law course taught in fall 2016 to welcome Dr. Cooper on the 10th anniversary of her classic uh, book entitled The Hanging of Angelique, which was a Governor General's uh, finalist. She, uh, award-winning poet and novelist Dion Brand, uh, referred to The Hanging of Angelique as the most important piece of Canadian history written in decades that shakes the earth beneath the Canadian national story. During uh, this current visit today, albeit virtual, uh, we have the privilege of learning from Professor Cooper's leadership at Dalhousie in her capacity as the chair of the scholarly panel on Lord Dalhousie's relationship to race and slavery. She was called author of that report, which was released one year ago in September 2019. What's particularly pathbreaking about that report and what situates it as part of a trajectory that many scholarly institutions, including our own, uh, are encouraged to follow is its conceptualization of slavery as a global institution. In other words, it speaks not only about the number of slaves in any particular place at any particular time, although that is important, nor does it chronicle the specific legislation in place or ascertain the existence of slavery or not in a particular territory. Rather, it speaks to the inevitable impact of an institution that was the central and legal institution worldwide for centuries. This necessarily includes being attentive to how the proceeds of the system of transatlantic slavery and the slave trade enabled institutions that we treasure to be built. In this regard, we cannot but acknowledge that McGill University is called to reckon with its own history of enslavement of Black and Indigenous peoples by its founder, James McGill, and the multiple ties to the global institution of slavery. The Lord Dan Housie Report, as you will see, sets a st high standard for universities and communities across Canada and worldwide. It is therefore fitting and important that we should have the opportunity to learn from this report and from the insights of its chair. I join my colleagues teaching property les biens in thanking Professor Cooper and welcoming her to McGill. Thank you, thank you Adele. Thank you for the invitation and um, thanks to all the other professors who were involved in extending this in invitation and also thanks to all the students who are online and all the other participants who are online at this um, to hear this lecture um, it's my pleasure to to give it 
And so I will be looking at slavery, race, and higher education um, with Dalhousie University as, as a focus of this inquiry. And I'm going to begin with the apology because um, Professor Blackett mentioned that a year ago we launched the report and at the launch of the report, the interim president at the time, Terry Balser, um, gave an apology. Now, the apology was the first recommendation. Um, we had we have a list, if you read the report, we have a list of 13 recommendations. And the very top, the very first one is the apology from the institution. And so she made this historic apology to the black community in Nova Scotia on September 5th, 2019. And I read it because it's not in the report. It came after the report. And she says, today, on behalf of Dalhousie University, I apologize to the people of African descent in our community. We regret the actions and views of George Ramsey, the ninth Earl Dalhousie, and the consequences and impact they have had in our collective history as a university, as a province, and as a region. Further, we acknowledge our dual responsibility to address the legacies of anti-Black racism and slavery while continuing to stand against anti-Black racism today. And so we, we, were, um, we were gratified that the institution came out and issued this apology. By the way, George Ramsey, the ninth Earl of Dalhousie, is Lord Dalhousie, after whom the institution uh, was named in 1818. And he was not necessarily you know, a, a, an educator. He came to the province as the lieutenant governor, he came to Nova Scotia in 1816 to um, take up his position. And uh, two years later, and we will know why, um, the college, it was then called Dalhousie College, was established. So what inspired such a robust apology? In the fall of 2016, Dalhousie University began its examination of the university and its namesake, Lord Dalhousie's views on slavery, race, and with specific regard to how these impacted the Black community. So a scholarly panel was commissioned. I was tasked um, to chair the panel and to lead the research effort that um, would uh, flow from, uh, from this initiative. And research happened over the course of two and a half years. And um, there are several researchers on, on the project. We visited archives in, in Canada, in uh, Nova Scotia Provincial Archives, Municipal Archives, in Ottawa Library and Archives Canada, um, in the UK, um, specifically London, the National Archives in London, and the Scottish National Archives in Edinburgh, and also places in um, Glasgow. The story we unearthed revealed Dalhousie's university and its namesake's imbrication with transatlantic slavery and concomitantly anti-blackness. So what was behind this inquiry? Why did the university decide um, to do this? Was it just, you know, a, a sudden idea? Did the light bulb go off in, in the head of, you know, some, someone in, in upper administration? Not really. Yes and no. The impetus behind the inquiry was that in 2015, the racial climate for black people faculty, students, staff, workers, janitors, everybody at the university could best be described as noxious. Racist graffiti, some of which, were, some of which graphically displayed the N-word, had been spray painted in diverse campus locations, including the, the main library, the Killam Library, and the entire fourth floor in a, a, between 2014 and 2015 was spray painted, the entire fourth floor. Think, think of that. And I ask myself, how did this happen? How could this happen without um, staff realizing it? Well, one staff did discover it. And the fourth floor had to be um, shut down and the yellow um, um, sticker uh, uh, going, going around was placed around it and they called campus police, campus police called the municipal police. Um, and you know, it took a while for them to repaint it. So that happened, but it was only in the library. All across in, in 
prayer spaces. We have a radio station. In the radio station, um, in the hallways, there were racist graffitis and anti-Muslim graffitis uh, were spray painted on campus. Black students also were complaining about their experience of racism in the classroom and other sites on campus. Furthermore, Blacks within and without the university had to respond to the frequent display of the Confederate flag flown across the province. That was normal. I mean, it's still flown in some places, but not so much as it used to be. And we'll come to why that's, that is the case. In fact, several members of the Dalhousie um, community, including myself, were involved in a press conference calling on the province to ban the Confederate flag. We also um, had formed a Black faculty and staff caucus, and we met with the then President Richard Florizone and the chair of Senate, uh, Kevin Hewitt, to discuss the anti-Black racism that seemed to have become a hallmark of university life. Members of the caucus also raised the issue of tenure, promotion, and retention. And others spoke about the whiteness of the university uh, curricula. Then there was the um, upcoming celebration of the 200th anniversary of the founding of the university. So the bicentennial was going to be a big deal. In fact, activities had started already in, um, to commemorate this important anniversary. Uh, and 2018, there was gonna be a big splash. It was gonna be 200 years. And that also came up at our meeting with the president in December of 2015. And those who attended the meeting referenced the negative attitudes and perspectives of George Ramsey, founder of the institution toward black people, especially the black refugees of the War of 1812. So that was kind of the elephant in the room. We're gonna celebrate 200 years of the founding of the institution, we're gonna celebrate uh, George Ramsey's heroic efforts in establishing the university. <laughs> but George Ramsey was a, was a racist. We posited that this racism had persisted, in the, had persisted since the university's beginning and continued to cast its shadow over the campus. And then, but we were not isolated. We were living in a, um, there was this microcosm. We were a microcosm of what was happening in the larger world. If you may recall, and it's still happening, students and faculty at numerous and diverse American universities were protesting their institution's failure to recognize their engagement with an accommodation of racism that um, targeted black people. A central demand of these students and faculty members was that their prospective institutions examine and acknowledge their connections to slavery and to slave trade and to make amends and reparations with respect to the Black community. Um, some of you may recall that uh, Professor uh, Wilder of MIT published Ebony and Ivy, and that book was one of the books that really shook the foundation of um, especially elite American universities um, with respect to their engagement with slavery. Ebony and Ivy was published in 2013. Of course, uh, some American universities had started their inquiry before 2013. Um, and we, we think of Brown University that started in, in 2014 and the president, Ruth Simmons, um, ask that the university do this inquiry and also write a report. And in fact, Brown, Brown University's report uh, really provided a framework for, for us, for many of us to do our own, our own work for many other institutions. So the, the, the call and you know, schools like Harvard and Yale, they have renamed um, some buildings and think of Yale, of Calhoun Hall. Everybody knows that Calhoun was, uh, oh my God, was a pro-slavery ideologue from South Carolina, um, was such a, a strong supporter of slavery. And Calhoun was this person who thought that black people were genetically inferior and that slavery was the best thing that could happen to them because slavery was a civilization school in which they would learn how to be human beings. 
And so you have this hall named after Calhoun. Fortunately, the hall has been renamed. And so the scholarly panel was established to inquire into Lord Dalhousie's relationship to raise slavery within the province of Nova Scotia and the wider Atlantic region. The panel received a mandate to do historical research, as I've said, a term um, the president and Senate established the terms of Senate, the terms of reference, and we went ahead to do this work. The panel met, uh, oh my goodness, we had numerous meetings over the course of two, two and a half years. The report was finally written and as I said, launched in, 20, in September 2019, a year ago. And six distinct areas of Dalhousie's engagement with race, slavery, and anti-blackness were discerned. And I'm going to lay out, I'm going to lay out um, these entanglements right now. So if we could begin with, here is Gabriel Hall. Um, he came to uh, Nova Scotia um, around 18, 1816, I, I believe, if memory serves right, as, as a child. He was, well, uh, an older teen. He was about 16 or 17. He came without parents. He was listed in, because they, they made all these lists of people who arrived on various ships at Halifax Harbor. And he, he was placed in the category of children who arrived without parents. So think of, of the, the war and you know, what it, the impact of the war on the black community within the Eastern Seaboard of the United States. So we'll just get to that right now. If Tina could go to slide 12, I will, slide 10, sorry. I will begin with Cochrane's pro proclamation. That's right. And Admiral Cochrane was a British admiral. And he, the War of 1812 was happening, the War of 1812 kicked off in 1812, and it lasted for two years um, between the United States and Britain. And of course, is, if Britain is fighting a naval war on the Atlantic uh, Ocean, Canada, at least this side, the Eastern Seaboard, is going to get involved. Well, the Central Canada also got involved, but in terms of the naval war, um, this side of Canada got involved in the war. And Cochrane did um, use the same strategy that 30 years previous um, Governor Dunmore in Virginia uh, used. Basically, 30 years previous during the American War of Independence, Dunmore issued a proclamation saying to enslaved African Americans, if you can join the side of the British, we're going to win the war. And when the war is over, we will give you your freedom. Well. And that's how you had the black loyalists come into Canada because the British didn't win the war, but they did um, sort of honor that promise and, and brought a number of um, people, black people who had fought, fought for them to Canada. Now, uh, Cochrane did the same thing. He was the admiral, the commander in chief of the, the British forces in the uh, North American theater of war. So he, he had ships cruising up and down the Atlantic. And he never used the word slaves, uh, cleverly did not use the word slaves, but he said if families who want to flee the United States and uh, they would be received on board his Maj majesty's ships or vessels of war and, you know, enter into his majesty's sea or land forces and being, they will be set free as settlers and sent to British possessions in North America or the West Indies. Well, what happened was thousands and thousands of enslaved Americans fled to the British lines, fled to British ships. Um, the war ended in December 1814. And again, the British did honor um, its promise of, of freeing people, these people who had worked for them as soldiers, sailors, spies. And we know 3,000 of these individuals arrived in Nova Scotia. Some were sent to New Brunswick. And they came mainly from the Chesapeake coastal Georgia, Louisiana, um, and Alabama. So the, the, they were called the Black Refugees of the War of 1812. I mean, they sort of were not real refugees, but that's the name that got stuck. So 
so they, are, they began arriving between 1814 and 1817. The last batch of black refugees arrived about 1817. Lord Dalhousie arrived in Nova Scotia in 1816 to take up his post as Lieutenant Governor. The Napoleonic War had just ended. Dalhousie had fought in the Napoleonic War. He reached the highest rank in, in the military. And one of the things that the British administration did with these veterans, with these elite veterans, was to give them um, governorships all over the colonial world. And so Dalhousie was one of them. And the moment he came to Nova Scotia, he began a campaign to rid the province of the black refugees. He saw Nova Scotia as a white man's country and therefore wished for and encouraged white settlers to make Nova Scotia their homes. Uh, so the refugees had entered an unfriendly and often hostile environment. In 1816, in December, so Dalhousie came in October. In December, he penned a letter to Lord Bathurst, his superior in London. And in the letter, Dalhousie articulated his frustrations with being tasked of settling hundreds of these black immigrants and not having the requisite resources to do so for him. <clears throat> but it was not simply his frustration that he, he vented to Bathurst. He also expressed his views on the suitability of the black refugees as worthy settlers. The most offending section of the letter, and this is what inspired our inquiry. Like I was so offended by the letter. And in 2012, I did a conference of the black refugees, African Canadians and the War of, uh, and the War of 1812, because in 2012 was 200 years since, since the war. And I did a conference. Um, and that was when I first came upon Dalhousie's letter in, in 2012. He wrote several, many, many letters to Bathurst. But in this first letter, or it was a second letter, he said the black refugees were slaves by habit and education, no longer working under the dread of the lash. Their idea of freedom is idleness, and they are therefore quite incapable of industry. Imagine that these people who had f fled um, under their own steam to British lines, who had been working for their slave masters for decade, uh, decades, but who fled to British lines. Um, the British, you know, didn't come on the plantation to rescue them. They had to uh, wade through those inlets and, and those swamps, etc., to reach the ships. And then upon reaching the ships, they, they worked as spies, as Marines, as soldiers. In fact, there was a unit called the Colonial Marines, which was composed exclusively of these black refugees. And um, coming into Nova Scotia, where they were cast upon these land with huge rocks jutting out of the ground, and yet they worked those lands. And here is Dalhousie saying, their idea of freedom is idleness and they're therefore quite capable of industry. And I'm gonna tag onto that. This idea of the black um, as a lazy individual is certainly one of the, uh, was one of the mainstays, ideological mainstays of slavery. And that is why in, in many of these uh, societies um, that had um, enslavement, you will find not only past laws, but you will find the curfew laws, you will find the sundown laws. I mean, there have been sundown, sundown laws across Canada up until, until recent times in the 1960s. Um, so these sun, sundown laws, basically that means that at sundown, blacks had to be off the street because they're gonna create trouble. It, you can see how um, those laws would come out of statements or, and beliefs like this one. The letter goes on to say, now here is, we know this man wanted to cast the black refugees outside of the province. The letter goes on to say, were it possible to procure for them a pardon from the government of the United States, it would be most desirable to restore them to their former masters, imagine that, in America, or send them to settlements in Sierra Leone. <laughs> that was the other preposterous idea of sending the black refugees back to slavery in the United States. It was just quite insane. Now, um, so 
Of course, the black refugees said, no, thank you. We are not going back to our former masters. We're not going to Sierra Leone. He also tried to get them to go to Trinidad. We're not going to Trinidad. Um, but remember, the Crown had promised the black refugees support for at least two, three years of their settlement, which is the kind of support that they promised to disbanded white soldiers of the war, of the War of 1812. Um, so support such as um, seeds, um, grains, blankets, foodstuff, flour, fish, pork, beef, uh, material for, for canvas for, to make tents just when they arrived, and, and farming implements. Um, by uh, June 1817, less than a year after his arrival in the, in the colony, Dalhousie cut the rations of the refugees even by half, by half even as he himself felt they would perish without such limited food supplies. And we know this because he would write to Bathurst continually, continuously, without um, supplies, without rations, they will perish, he said. He also failed to accord them sufficient farmland, instead leaving them to subsist on small plots described as the worst kind of land. And I just gonna end this section that by saying that the head of a refugee family receive eight to ten, 10 acres of land. By comparison, white settlers were accorded 100 acres or more of arable land. Dalhousie's other anti-black strategy was deportation out of the province, and we, we talked about that. By calling the slaves or the black refugees slaves by habit and education, Dalhousie did not see them as free people and worthy settlers or agential individuals who had earned their freedom. Rather, he saw them as servile persons. He still seen them as slaves, as servile persons who had to be whipped into submission. His attitudes towards the Black refugees and Black Nova Scotians as a whole, and his policies marginalized African Nova Scotians in almost every aspect of their lives. For example, the small acreage of acreages of rocky land and swampy soil ensure that the refugees would not become successful human farmers or attain any modicum of economic independence. So they were seen as a reserve army of labor. They were placed in segregated communities um, or close, that were close enough to white farms so they could work as laborers for white farmers. Um, this meant that the, all these policies meant that the black refugees faced social, economic, and political marginalization. Um, so if we could just go back, Tina, to some of uh, the, the previous slides before slide 10 with Cochrane, I would appreciate that. Um, yes, yeah, so we talked about that. If you keep going down, next one, please. Next one. Uh, yeah. And so that was the, the, the first, the first uh, relationship of Dalhousie University to slavery or, you know, the black refugees of the War of 1812. Now we're gonna look at Dalhousie's Martinique experience during the Franco-British War, and that would be slides eight and nine. Thank you. Well, this, this is certainly Dalhousie's first tie to slavery, his, his work in the Caribbean. Um, in 1794, the British army invaded Martinique on the invitation of royalist French planters who were incensed that the abolitionist-minded Republican revolutionary government in France had abolished slavery on the island, had abolished slavery. If you may recall at this time, the French Revolution is going on. The Haitian Revolution is also certainly going on. The Republican government in France was a, a liberal-minded government, and there were people, radicals within that government, that pressed for the abolition of slavery in the French colonies, and it did happen. So slavery was abolished in Martinique, in Guadeloupe, in Haiti, and in other places. But the royalist planters, um, some of them sent their representatives to London, England, and asked that the British invade Martinique, restore um, royalist rule, and they 
would be restored as slave owners. And Dalhousie led um, several of the invading regiments and did indeed um, restore slavery on the island. The British were successful in, in their invasion. In return, he was appointed governor of the island. Slavery was reestablished and thus robbed, um, and he thus robbed the black slaves of the short freedom they had obtained under revolutionary rule. Well, that uh, didn't happen in Haiti, as we know. We know Napoleon tried um, under uh, Leclerc to invade Haiti, that failed. We know <laughs> um, Simcoe from Upper Canada, who is hailed as some kind of anti-slavery hero, when he went back to England, was sent to Haiti um, to lead the invading force, the British invading force on Haiti to reestablish slavery. That didn't work, that didn't, wasn't successful. So I asked the question, was it in Martinique that the damning stereotype of black people that Dalhousie subscribed to began to take shape? Was it here that he began subscribing to the notion that black people were slaves by habit and education and that they were intrinsically lazy and would only work if whipped. What we do know is that it was during this Martinican experience that the, the Earl, he later became a Duke, had his first encounter with a black community. And further, this experience of conquest and re-enslavement helped influence his subsequent views and perception perceptions about African peoples. Two decades later, in Nova Scotia, Dalhousie would express the white supremacist logic that Blacks were naturally suited for slavery. Um, we could just look at the, the next slide, please. Um, conclusions to be drawn. You can see that. And, and I just want to point out here that Dalhousie was, was a Scotsman. And of course, Scotland joined um, the Union, the Union of Great Britain and Northern Ireland in 1707. And once Scotland joined that Union, um, Scotland went enthusiastically into the slave trade, just like ev everybody else. So, um, you know, I'm from the island of Jamaica and the, the middle management on Jamaica in, in Jamaica during slavery and other colonies were staffed by, by Scotsmen, the, um, the attorneys, the doctors, in fact, the universities in Edinburgh and in Glasgow, their medical schools produced a lot of doctors went, that went all around the colonial world and many of them found employment on the slave plantations. So Scotland was right in there and the Scot Scottish people, um, the merchants and traders developed this really tight commercial network. I mean, talk, talk about being um, clannish, you could see that. And in fact, they, they relied on clan um, si systems and clan network to engage themselves in the transatlantic um, slave system. There, there's a, a scholar here in Halifax at St. Mary University, Carly Kehoe, who is examined examining that um, connection, Scotland and slavery. And of course, other historians in Scotland and elsewhere have done that. So I'm saying that Dalhousie coming from Scotland would have been also familiar with Scotland's participation in the slave trade. Now, if we could turn to uh, um, the other entanglement, the West India trade or the West Indies trade, let's look at slide, um, slide 19. So slide 19 is a Castine fund. And so this ties directly to the foundation of the university, of Dalhousie University. War of 1812 is happening. The, the governor at that time was a man called Sherbrooke. He uh, took members of the British military and militias in Nova Scotia, sailed down to, to Maine, to a, a poor town called Castine invaded Castine, took over Castine, uh, and, um, and when they left a couple of months later, they had something like 12,000 Halifax pounds with them that were duties that were paid on ships coming in from the West Indies with slave-made products. 
or slave grown products um, to the port of Castine in Maine. They brought the money back. The money belonged to the king or, or to the crown, I should say. And the money sat there for, for at least two years. And then Dalhousie came in as governor. And so the urgent question is, well, what are we gonna do with the Castine Fund? Now, the Secretary of State in England, Bathurst, we talked about him earlier, basically said to Dalhousie, do what you will with the Castine Fund. You can build roads, build bridges, you know, establish a market, um, or use the money to help in the settlement of the refugees and some of the white veterans who were coming in and who needed a lot of help. And Dalhousie said no, he said the money is just gonna fritter away and he wanted to make the money, um, put the money to good use. So here is the, he had this idea. He said that the city or the province um, needs a good school, a good college, and he was gonna use the monies from the Castine Fund to establish the college. And that's exactly what happened. The first, um, the, the donation, well, not, not donation, endowment, the original endowment for Dalhousie University came from the Castine Fund and it helped to build in infrastructure and also to pay some of the early professors. Let's go to the next slide, please. And so the West India trade, is another example of Dalhousie's university's connection to slavery and the slave trade. During the period of Caribbean slavery, the Nova Scotian economy was heavily dependent on a trade system that was an offshoot of the triangular trade. Really, it was how Nova Scotia inserted itself in the world of um, Atlantic commerce that was based on slavery. Halifax was a major port in the British Atlantic and part of the com and thus a part of the commodity exchange system that linked the Caribbean, other parts of the maritime, the eastern seaboard of the United States, Lower and Upper Canada, Britain, Europe, West Africa, the Mediterranean, and beyond. And slave labor, as we know, was the raison d'etre of the West Indies trade. Halifax and other provincial merchants traded salt beef. Uh, salt, uh, salt beef and dried uh, salted fish, pork, timber, flour, staves, horses, and other goods to the West Indian slave plantations in exchange for um, slave made products, rum, sugar, molasses, cocoa, coffee, and other products. And that was how this um, region of Canada inserted itself in, the, in, in transatlantic commerce or Atlantic commerce. The West India trade was just a mainstay of the economies of Nova Scotia, the broad Atlantic region, and upper and lower Canada. And we don't have time to go into that. The trade also fostered shipbuilding, banking, insurance, uh, which led to further infrastructural development of the region. And so the, if, you, if we could go to the next slide, please. And, and this is of the Halifax Wharf. If you look on the, the, the sort of boardwalk there, you will see those barrels and, and those um, casks. Well, it was in these barrels that the pork and the beef and the dried fish would be um, stored, placed on ships, sent to the West Indies. And um, in return, the molasses, the wet sugar, um, the coffee and cocoa and so forth would be placed in these uh, barrels and cars or in sacks and sent up to the Atlantic, um, uh, up to the Atlantic coast. As I said, the, so the, the, so we talked about the Castine Fund. Now here we have another source of income coming into the province and this is the, the taxes that are gained from the ships coming in, from inbound ships. They are taxed, the products that they carry are taxed, and we know that 30% of this tax between um, specific years was also given to Davos University as another set of endowment monies 
to assist the university in its growth. So 30% of the income earned from custom duties collected um, from these ships were also given to the university. Bear in mind, bear in mind that these products that are coming in, as I've said, were produced by enslaved people in the West Indies. So Dalhousie could have used some of these monies to, um, to provide sufficient food to the refugees to ward off starvation. Instead, he decided that the province needed a university and used the money to establish a school which bore his name. West Indian slave money helped to fund, found, and develop Dalhousie University. Yet given the racist nature of Nova Scotian society, black people would not have access to this institution for a very long time. Further connection of the university to the West India trade is that the official residence, and this is interesting because when, when we went for that meeting in 2015, at the home of the president, there's an official residence of the president, I saw a little plaque on the side of the wall in the living room or the sitting room. And it says, this house originally belonged to Levy Hart, a West Indian merchant. I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, it was really cool seeing the slide and I brought the president's attention to it. Uh, so Levy Hart, the Bennett, a former prime minister of Canada and a, and a Dal alumnus bought that property and donated it to Dalhousie University. You know, uh, um, many alumni, they love their university and they do nice things like that for the university. So he, he bought the property and they um, renovated it to become the official resident of, resident of, the, of, the, of the president. But it was originally constructed by Levy Hart, a West India merchant. And for those listening, Levy Hart, it does mean he's from the West Indies or he's a West Indian. It just means um, he participated in the trade that we just described. Now, if we could just turn to another connection, and we will begin with slide 28. And it is a slavery compensation money. Now, you may know that the, when slavery ended in the, in the British Empire, the British Crown paid compensation money to the slave owners or the former slave owners. So the white people received compensation, but not the black people who had been slaving for Britain for close to three centuries. Anyway, uh, they were paid 25 million pounds, the owners, and that included everybody, individuals, corporations, institutions. We know about the Anglican Church, how much they collected, you know, a ton of money from the compensation um, fund. Well, here in Halifax, as documented by Nicholas Draper in his book about who received compensation money, and Eric Williams before a Draper also talked about this, we discovered at least two important um, Halifax families that received money, the Almonds and the Johnstons. And the Almonds and the Johnstons are like the creme de la creme of society. They are involved in politics, in banking, in, um, in all kinds of, in insurance, in all kinds of other ac activities. And they were, they also served as trustees or governors of Dalhousie University and King's College. And they were connected by marriage. They just intermarried each other. They were awarded, were awardees of slave compensation monies paid out by the British government. One influential member of this family was Mather Biles Allman, and a street is named after the family here, a leading figure in banking, insurance, and politics and both a Dalhousie and King's College governor. Another family member was James William Johnston, brother-in-law to Almond. Johnston was a lawyer, politician, judge, and provincial premier. He was also one of the founders of Acadia University and the Bank of Nova Scotia. Johnston was Jamaican by origin. He was born in Jamaica, and then the family came to Nova Scotia. And they were trustees, the Almonds and the Johnstons were trustees of Mount 
the Mount Salus, S-A-L-U-S, Mount Salus Slave Plantation in St. Andrew, Jamaica. So imagine that. One uh, would not have uh, thought that in, in Canada there would be people receiving slavery compensation money, but it really shows the, the interconnectedness of the British Empire. I mentioned Johnson was Jamaican or born in Jamaica. His family were white loyalists from the United States. Some of the loyalists, when they lost the war, they came to Canada. Certainly many of them fled to Jamaica and to Bahamas. And those places were part of the British Empire. And so once they uh, arrived in those places, they continued the, their, the old activity. And that was the activity of slavery. And the Johnson family was certainly one of these. 500 pounds they received in 1833, that would be worth today, in today's money, um, close to 65,000 British pounds. Now, if we could just jump to um, slide 30. Here's another imbrication. And the active support of the Confederacy by some of Dalhousie's early leaders. And so the head of the, the first head of Dalhousie's medical school and founder of the Medical Association of Nova Scotia was Dr. William Johnston Almond from the same family I just talked about, trained as a doctor in Edinburgh. Uh, he was also a politician and a rabid supporter of the Confederacy, we are told by Greg Marquis, who wrote this book on the Confederacy and its supporters in Canada. Um, Dr. Allman gave large sums of money to the cause and assisted Confederates who took refuge in, in Halifax. He also used his power and influence to assist Confederate blockade runners. Dr. Allman was implicated in helping Confederates, Confederate pirates hijack the American steamer, the Chesapeake. He could break the law with impunity, Allman, because the circle in which he moved and Halifax itself were solidly pro-Confederate. So imagine that. Here, the, the, the United States is fighting a war. Certainly many Canadians supported the Union. Certainly many Canadians went to fight for the Union. But there were many Canadians who supported the Confederacy. In fact, Alman assisted Confederate naval officer John Taylor Wood escape through Halifax with his blockade running ship, the Tallahassee. You may have heard of the Tallahassee. The doctor also, the doctor's son, Dr. Bruce Allman, joined the Confederate Army where he served as a surgeon. Dr. Allman also sponsored a prize at, King, at King's College for, to the memory of Stonewall Jackson. He would give something like, um, a, a, you know, a respectable amount of money to the student who could write an ode in Latin to the memory of Stonewall Jackson. Stonewall Jackson, as you know, is a Confederate or was a Confederate general. Now on the point of the Confederate flag being flown today, many Confederates, when the war ended, took up residence in Nova Scotia and they opened businesses, they um, joined the highest circle of society. In fact, John Taylor Wood came back to Nova Scotia opened the hardware store where he flew openly the Confederate flag. Little wonder then that his offending symbol is still displayed on some buildings, license plates, and the back of trucks across the region today. Now, um, I'm gonna wrap up, but finally I'd like to talk about the pro-slavery stance of some of Dalhousie's early presidents. So like Thomas McCulloch, and um, Hugo Reed, the print, one, one of the early principals, these men were also writers, and they wrote at the time supporting the American Civil War. Hugo Reed thought that blacks were naturally inferior and abolition um, would just cause chaos in society and that the Confederacy should be supported by the larger world. Now, Dalhousie University, is the first university in Canada to engage in this type of work. This is apropos 
apropos given the historic nature of Nova Scotia's Black community, which traces its beginning to 1604 when the presence of a Black man at Port Royal, which is um, during the French period, Acadie, in service of Sir de Goa de Mont is recorded. In the following centuries, diverse streams of Blacks from the United States, the Caribbean, Africa, and other parts of the world arrived as enslaved persons, free people, Black refugees, maroon exiles, workers, and immigrants who settled, intermarried, and formed this North American African diaspora community. Now, our report draws inspiration from the United Nations Human Rights Report on the People of African Descent in Canada, that's a report, and on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, and the numerous reports produced by American and British universities in their examination of their institution's historic connection to transatlantic slavery, the slave trade, and racial injustice. Um, so if we could just jump to slide 38 and 39, please. In investigating Dalhousie's relationship to race and slavery in the report, the panel put forth a series of 13 recommendations grouped under the rubric of regret and responsibility, repair and recognition with the aim of fostering re uh, reconciliation between the university and the black, uh, local black community. In doing so, Dalhousie can achieve some of its commitment to equity, diversity, and reparative justice for all Blacks at the university. And I think I will, um, I, I'll just stop uh, there if we, um, yeah, I'll just stop there, uh, I'll pretty much wrap up. We know that some universities like McGill um, and uh, King's College, here in Halifax has also done an inquiry. Uh, we know that the University of uh, New Brunswick is also considering do, doing an inquiry. So um, our report, uh, we hope it has inspired these schools to go forth and do a report of their own to that would examine their institution's relationship to some of these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Cooper. Um, so we're going to start a uh, question and answer session now. Uh, you feel free to pose your questions to Professor Cooper. Um, if you could raise your hands in the participant uh, in the participant way with the hand, that would be wonderful. Um, and I will call on you. Um... Okay. Okay. Laura. Hi, um, thank you, Professor Cooper, for your time. Um, I was wondering, you have probably come to learn about the Take James McGill Down campaign at McGill University, which aims to um, push the university to recognize the deep racist roots uh, in, uh, of James McGill, the, the founder of the university, uh, take the statue down, but also create a department uh, for Black and African studies, um, where it would be mostly uh, well, all Black staffs, um, and give more uh, funds for resources for Black students and uh, Black scholars on campus. Um, I was wondering whether, uh, from your experience working on this report, you would have any advice for the students uh, that are involved in this campaign on how to push the university to be more responsive? Um. I um, Sure, thank you for your question. I, we, we had at Dalhousie at the time in 2015, what, you, you would say that the, the stars were perfectly aligned, really, they were. We had a president who was committed to equity. He's not here anymore, he's left. That's Richard Florizon committed to equity. We had a chair of Senate who, was an Af who is an African-Canadian man. He's still the chair of Senate, Kevin Hewitt. Um, uh, he's a physicist, uh, but he, not but, he's a physicist and was also involved in a lot of equity issues on campus. And then you had the Black faculty and staff caucus that was very 
activist in its orientation. So we were fortunate in, in that regard. At the same time, um, they, they, they're, it, 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 it really wasn't easy. Cause you had to convince other important bodies in the university that this was a worthy cause to have um, this investigation. No, the investigation has happened and we are now really pushing for the recommendations to be implemented. Um, to that end, the university hired a vice provost for equity, uh, diversity and inclusiveness and who is Dr. Teresa Rajatali. So my advice would be <laughs> that you just have to keep pushing. That's really it. And you have to think and act strategically. Who are the people on campus or within the university community who have equity, you know, as at the top of their agenda? So that's one. Who are the people? You identify the persons. You identify the units within the university. So maybe a particular faculty, maybe the law school, um, who who you know would support support um, your, your, your cause and you bring all these people together. I mean, sometimes they can't be in the same place at the same time, but there has to be uh, what could be called a network of allyship. And that's what we did at Dalhousie. We identified every single unit, every single person that we we thought were interested in in this issue but we were also helped by the atmosphere or by the the, the context at the time in the world it's interesting because this was before george floyd but if you remember that all the american um university campuses well not all of them but a lot of them were up in arms about some of the issues that you're up in arms about and those students would not stop so one has to be consistent, one has to be determined, one has to have the vision. And I think for us, it was this big division we had and we were gonna continue to push through. And you also have to find outside supporters. It can't be just a university thing, a campus thing. We went outside of the university to the community, to different stakeholders, in, in the black community and in other communities, not only in black communities, but in other communities and say, hey, this is what we're doing. Because our school and certainly your school too, what Dalhousie is, um, the word people use you know, uh, these days is influencer, right? Dalhousie is a leading influencer in the Atlantic provinces. It's a flagship school in the Atlantic provinces. It employs thousands of people. It, um, it, the, the, the medical school here work with the medical, the regional medical communities. The law school here work with the, re, these are very influential institutions. So they reach beyond the university into the wider community into, and also into the country at large. So you have to step out of the campus and, and find allies to help you do this work. That's been our experience. Thank you. Um, Shona, you have a question? Yeah, um, thank you so much for giving the talk. It was really informative and interesting. My question is basically around naming and kind of related to Laura's question as well. Um, I'm not sure if it came up in the report. From what I saw, it didn't. Um, the issue of maybe changing the name since it does bear the name of someone who had these entanglements with um, anti-Black racism and whether that's an important part of reckoning with these legacies. Yes, the naming, the naming certainly came up. It was a big um, uh, item on the, on, you know, on the discussion. And um, people came up with all uh, different ideas about that. At the end of the day, it was decided that we weren't going to press, press the issue of naming because we did our investigations with the Board of Governors, renaming an entire university would cost millions of dollars from changing the logo on the envelope to, you know, to more, more complex things. And we thought 
um, that money could be better spent um, in establishing more scholarships for students in doing cluster hires with respect to faculty and, and staff in establishing um, international relationships with universities and colleges in the West Indies. And if you look at our 13 recommendations, that's one of the recommendations since the university and the province profited so much from the West India trade. And so this monies, uh, these monies could be spent to um, build infrastructure, academic infrastructure within the Caribbean and so forth. So that's why um, at the end of the day, the committee in consultation with many, many people, by the way, um, said um, it, it probably wouldn't be wise now to change the name of the university given how much it would cost. But I, I'd like to say that that issue is still on the table. It's still on the table because the report, it's, it's dynamic. It's still ongoing. I told you that a year ago, the university hired a VP um, equity, diversity, and inclusiveness. That came out of the report. The, just maybe about two weeks ago, uh, director for African Nova Scotian strategy was hired. That came out of the report. So it's like this um, living document that that will continue to live, that will continue to change. So it's dynamic. So I, I'm sure the issue of naming will come up again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question in the chat, Professor Cooper. Um, it's from Khadija Ahmed and she says, thank you, Professor Cooper, for your presentation. You mentioned how slaves were categorized as refugees in 1812. Could you further discuss the intersection of immigration status and property? Specifically, to what extent citizenship status precluded Black Nova Scotians from acquiring or maintaining wealth, either historically or in the present day Black community in Nova Scotia? Okay, thank you. Um, well, I said it was unfortunate that they were called refugees because hmm, it, it's, a, it's an unfortunate term. You know, the Black Loyalists weren't called refugees, even though they were like the refugees, they were also refugees. But nonetheless, that was a term that um, they were described um, by, by the, 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 the British ruling, uh, ruling people, the ruling elite. How were they accord citizenship rights? Well, at the time, they were promised the rights, um, rights as British subjects. The, we, we, we're in the, an imperial period, the, the British Empire. These people fought for the crown during this war. When the war ended, they were taken to other uh, colonial sites. As I mentioned, 3,000 came to the maritime provinces. About 800 was sent down, were sent down to Trinidad. Some went to Bermuda and so on. But no, they were not accorded rights as British subjects. In fact, when they came into Nova Scotia, in, in many ways, they were denied those rights. And people like Dalhousie and Governor Sherbert before him, and Governor Kent after him, made sure it, it was almost like they wanted them to die by denying them uh, these basic, you know, the basic stuff, the, the flour, the terrible dried fish, which is just full of salt anyway. Um, but anyway, it, it, it kept uh, body and soul alive um, by segregating them into these you know, communities where, where the soil was sterile and yet at the same time um, they were able to produce food stuff from the soil. People talk about growing pumpkins and growing cabbages on rocks. So but what that did though, that type of marginalization which also went over into the educational realm so segregated schooling and in some respects there were uh, uh, no schools at all for refugee children had a long lasting e effect 
that we're still grappling with to this day. So I have two slides here that talk about the, the, the street checks. In 2019, we had the Halifax street, check, street Checks report. In 2011, there was another report. And it all shows how these reports show how Black people are um, overly um, surveilled within the province. In fact, the most recent report says that Black men are nine times more likely, and I wouldn't even say more likely, Black, black men are nine times street checked more than any anyone else and black women are six times so black people as a whole are placed under this surveillance which um this type of surveillance is uh, and, and then funneled into into carceral institutions um has a long history from the time of dalhousie and even before dalhousie so th there's the issue of um, mass incarceration of over arrest of bad schooling, of um, limited economic opportunities in terms of jobs and employment that we're still dealing with today, you know, September 17th, 2020. So they were denied rights as British subjects 200 years ago. And today, I mean, Canada is supposedly independent, so it's independent country, supposedly. Um, they are still denied rights as Canadian citizenships. People talk about second class citizenship, third class citizenship, uh, so on and so forth. So it's still a vexing question. And when the United Nations came here in 2017, 2016, 2017, and did its report on Black Canada, which you should read, it's available online. These are some of the issues that the UN identified. And the UN talked about the legacies and the UN uh, called on the government, the Trudeau, Trudeau one in 2015, to issue reparations to uh, black communities across Canada, especially here in the Maritime. The Trudeau government has not, the report was published in 2017, has not to this day responded to that report. Thank you. Um, Alexandra. First of all, hello, Professor. Thank you so much um, for your talk today. Um, so um, for my context, um, I'm Canadian, but I lived in the US for almost seven years. So a lot of my education um, was about, you know, uh, American history and the American uh, slave trade. Um, and it's very interesting to me um, to get all this information you provided today because in liberal circles in the US, there is this tendency to glorify Canada as like, you know, the perfect image, like what, you know, what the US would like to attain. Um, you mentioned earlier the, uh, someone asked about the changing of the university's name. Um, something that I've heard as a concern is um, the issue of whitewashing um, for posterity. The fear that, um, you know, if uh, everything is changed, we won't understand or remember, um, you know, what, what, was, what happened and what Dal Dalhousie did. Um, I wanted your thoughts on ways to preserve uh, a more accurate historical memory and your thoughts on like a statue to the black refugees, for example. Right, thank you. Um, in the recommendations, and I urge you to read the report, you can take your time, it's, it's over a hundred pages. And it's online, so um, please read it. And you look, and, and look at the recommendations that are sort of towards the end of the report. The, and we, we recommend that the street, some of the street names on campus, cause it, it's also, it's an urban campus. It's, it's, you know, there are parts of it that's on a main street, for example, but, but also the, the avenues and the alleyways on the campus itself be renamed to reflect um, the the experience of black people and indigenous people the last fall or to, toward the beginning of winter last year that did happen in the one street was renamed Matthew da Costa Row I mean it's not a major thoroughfare it's one of these little university streets but nonetheless 
it was renamed. And that again came out of our recommendations, renaming. We're also asking that the Lord Dalhousie room, there's a room called Lord Dalhousie room, which is kind of a, a beautiful room where you can have uh, uh, seminars, be renamed the Gabriel Hall room, or and you saw the image of Gabriel Hall earlier on, or, or be given the name of some other um, black person. But I like Gabriel Hall. He's one of my favorite people. <laughs> um, the, the, and, and this will happen too. I know it will happen. Public art to reflect this history of slavery and the slave trade, a memorial plaque or you know, a relevant um, symbol be placed on campus to remember the experience of the Black refugees of the War of 1812 and the slave trade and also the West India trade. So as I've said, the, the, the whole process is ongoing. What is important, and I must um, underscore this, is that there's a lot of inertia in universities and, and the systems that, that they create. It's people who staff universities. You know, we talk about universities, we think it's just, we think often think it's something theoretical out there or, but it's people, we're talking about human beings who, who are deciding whether or not they're gonna go forward with certain initiatives, right? So you write a report, but there might be people within the universities who say, oh yeah, they have 13 recommendations. We're going to ignore them for as long as we can. And, you know, maybe people are a fool, will leave and she'll retire. And then the report will gather dust on the shelf. And that is always there. So this is where you talk about the whitewashing coming in. Um, the Board of Governors has authorized the, 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 the process, authorized the report, applauded the report when, when it was done. But if, if you don't push for these changes, it's not gonna happen. And so this is, oh, we did a report. We did our, um, we made this commitment to equity and we, we have rolled it out. What more do you want? But unless there are people there to ensure that there, these recommendations and more, because people come up, will have other ideas to make sure that the, the report takes on flesh, then it won't happen. Thank you. Um, our next question is from Chukwubikim. So it's pronounced Chukwubikim, we can also call me Chu. Um, okay. Yeah. So thank you, Professor Cooper, for the, the talk. It was very, very fascinating. Um, I had a specific question that sort of came from that quote that you discussed uh, from Lord Alhousie, the one about uh, enslaved people as being slaves by habit and education. Um, definitely very offensive. I can agree with that. Um, and I was just wondering to what extent, or we're just hoping you could expand on this idea that um, you know, property rights in Title I to four agency over one's property. So if you don't have agency, if you lack agency, to what extent does that relegate you automatically to the status of being property? Um, I was having a conversation with Professor Moise and he was saying that, yeah, property rights, the law over a thing or the law, yeah, being, have, having property rights over a thing sort of are an expression of our individual agency or an indi individual freedom. So is it true that like it's just a binary proposition where if you have agency and you have that autonomy, that entitles you to those rights? And if you're lacking of that, you automatically just become property. Okay. I would say that when, when Dalhousie arrived in, I mean, Dalhousie is an aristocrat, right? He belongs to the nobility. He's a soldier. He just came off fighting napoleon he was in spain and other places but he you know he's an aristocrat he belongs to an empire where slavery and the slave trade was what made that empire rich so for him to come to nova scotia and other places he later went to quebec as governor general of of british north america 
but nonetheless, he's used to seeing black people in a servile position. He's used to seeing black people as slaves. He's used to seeing black people, as he said, working under the lash, kind of whipping them into submission. He's used to seeing them as this property. Now here they are, they're saying, we have agency, we have fled our masters, we have sailed, uh, you know, the ocean blue. We're, we're here, we're free people, we're British subjects. The king promised us all these rights. The king promised us land, the king promised us um, uh, rights, and we are going to exercise those rights. And the king promised us certain, um, certain benefits, and we're gonna ask for those benefits. So what you're having now is the, 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 the side of the ruling class saying, no, 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 you're not gonna get that because we are used to you as being slaves. If you go and work for white farmers and they pay you, I don't know, 50 cents a week, we're perfectly happy with that. But you cannot exert your subjectivity in this space that we call Nova Scotia or Canada. So certainly it seems to me Dalhousie is looking at the uh, refugees, the black refugees, through the lens of slavery and, um, and what he identified them as is that, is property, is object, is chattel, who are really not intelligent people. Um, you can't depend on them to know what's good for them. He said, I know what's good for you and what's good for you is the lash. So clearly, 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 he is seeing them through the lens of slavery and through with, uh, with this, I seen them as, as property, maybe property owned by the British crown perhaps, um, but if not property to be owned by the white uh, settlers and, and farmers. So I hope that understand, that explains, um, um, that provides a suitable explanation to your question. And, and so it's this idea, but think about when emancipation happens throughout the Americas, right? So Britain had emancipation in 1834, and then we had the final emancipation in 1888 in Brazil. So maybe from about, um, so in fact, for, for all of the 19th century, it was a century of emancipation. So, you know, African peoples were legally emancipated from slavery in, in these various territories. But what happened after emancipation? They were still not seen as complete, uh, someone asked a question about citizenship, as complete citizens, as complete subjects, subjects of this state or territory or whatever it is. So emancipation and some, that cause someone to write a book, I can't remember the name of the author, it says, neither slave nor free, or half free, half slave, because emancipation happened, but black people still weren't allowed to vote. In many respects, they still couldn't own property, they still couldn't go to school, um, they still couldn't open businesses. So the, the, the ruling class that never changed, it's the same ruling class from the slavery period or, or, or their children or grandchildren, still viewed the newly emancipated people as property. It's interesting, that's something you can um, discuss and that's something that uh, it really is worth investigating. So we, we are now here in the 21st century and we still see black bodies being used or being described or being thought of as this thing that is not quite human. Thank you. I think we have time for one more quick question, uh, Mark. No, it's okay. I will, I will withdraw my question and Keegan, Keegan can ask. His okay, story. Keegan, do you want to? Hi, um, so thank you for that talk, uh, Professor Cooper, that was great. And uh, what you had just kind of hinted to uh, with the talk of like being second class citizen even after emancipation. Um, last year, uh, we had a, a talk on Christie v. York and uh, 
we had a, a guest speaker, Barrington Walker, who kind of described this uh, environment as being almost like Canada's equivalent or Canada's, uh, yeah, I guess equivalent to Jim Crow uh, laws. So that's, I think, something very important. Also, um, talking sort of about this idea of uh, Canada as being almost like a utopia compared to the slave uh, context uh, sl or enslavement context within the United States. Um, the idea of not knowing Canada's history, um, that's something that I've kind of dealt with. Uh, my family's from Nova Scotia, but I grew up in Ontario. And almost all of my interactions with Black history came through um, just living and being around people from Nova Scotia. So I'm wondering, like, how, how can we as a society and as a country kind of address this issue of a lack of understanding of the black context and blackness within Canada being deep rooted and there being this long standing history that we just don't address, excuse me, don't address. Okay, thank you. Um, well, you know, uh, it's been, certainly I always say that the call to diversify the curriculum has been going on, I would say, since the Second World War, right? So the past 75 years. In 1957, the Toronto School Board banned the use of the book, The Little Black Sambo. Should look, you should look at that book, maybe it's online somewhere. Um, because the parents, Black parents and, and others are saying this, this is just a terrible book. I don't want my kid to um, be exposed to this book because the Little Black Sambo was a staple across school board in, in, in Canada and the United States. So think of that, 1957, the Little Black Sambo was banned. And throughout the 60s, throughout the 70s, I have read so many um, different kinds of curricula. I even wrote two for Toronto District School Board. I wrote one for grade seven for hi history that would be social studies. And I wrote one for grade 10 history. I don't think they went anywhere. That was in the early 2000s. <laughs> Nothing happened to them. The curriculum wasn't, uh, you know, diversified to put black, black history on that. But, you know, someone talked about whitewashing and the, the, the author, there, there's this book called The Spook Who Sat By The Door. The book is called The Spook Who Sat By The T Door. I can't remember the name of the author, but you can find it. And he talks about in the book how, it's a novel by the way, where they, the CIA hired this black man because people were saying that the CIA needs, to, needs diversity and it's an all white organization. So they hired this black guy as a spy He's very trained. He has like a fourth degree black belt, very a highly trained in spy work, but they didn't give him anything to do. They just put him in a glass office. He sat there. When people came off the elevator, they said, oh, there's a black guy working for the CIA. So this is what the school boards have um, been doing over the years, right? They hire people to write curricular uh, material, pay them, but they don't integrate these uh, material into into the, the the curriculum itself and so but i think we have a, an opportunity here in this moment it seems that the death of george floyd has stirred the conscience of white people and of institutions hopefully it has stirred the conscience i think so i don't know i could be wrong but there seems to be a bit of opening and with push coming from diverse sectors of the black community. Um, if you listen to CBC at any moment, you'll hear people talking about curriculum, black history, nothing. And some parents are saying, we're not gonna wait on the school board, we're just gonna go ahead and write our own curriculum and teach our own kids. And I would like to say, I'd like people to remember that black people have been doing that for decades, like teaching their own kids. I remember when I lived in Toronto, I was involved with these after after school programs where people got together 
and, and they had these tutorial programs, these sat Saturday programs too. It was after school or on the weekend. There are always these Black Heritage programs going on that were run by the community. That's something that's been happening, um, as I said, since the Second World War. But the um, white society seemed finally to have got it, hopefully. And I, I know like Peel, Peel Region School Board, for example, is overhauling its, its, its curriculum. And that's hopeful. That is really hopeful. But so we can't stop there. We have to keep pushing, as I've said before. We have to be vigilant. Um, we have to continue doing the work of um, teaching, not necessarily our, our kids, teaching adults. Adults need to be taught too. We have to continue doing that work, our own community schools, um, in order for, for the, because you know, you all are talking about the, the ignorance in going through Canadian school system. You can go from kindergarten to university and not know anything about black. Canadian history, not know that slavery um, was a fact of life within Canada or the British North American colonies. How is that possible? How is that possible that you've been to school for 12 years, this is public school, and three or four or eight in university, and you do not, uh, never had access to this knowledge? So to me, that's like a national disgrace. And um, we, we, we keep doing the work to, to just, open that door to, to what I will call enlightenment. Thank you so much, Professor Cooper. Such an important point to end on, I think. This point about education um, curricu curriculum, especially now in the sort of COVID times when, when, um, when so many people are contemplating their own kind of educational programs. Um, so Professor Cooper, I just wanted to thank you um, really, truly, um, really deeply um, from all of us. Uh, as you can see in the chat, students are so appreciative um, of your comments, of, your, of the context that you've provided for these issues, of your advocacy on behalf of um, Black Nova Scotians um, and, and others. Um, I think that the, you know, I think what, what's reflected to us from your document, um, from the Lloyd Dalhousie report is just the, um, just the amount of work um, and the what I want to recognize, in fact, is the um, is the kind of labor you've done in in situating Lord Dalhousie historically and the kind of empathy that you've had to have for your subject. I mean, that came through to me so many times um, in um, in 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 your discussion of how um, much you had to put yourself back in this um, in this foreign country in this other time and kind of reflect on what was going on. And I think that's a kind of, um, the, your intention in your historicity is, um, is, is really compelling. And I would invite the students, if you're interested in learning more about um, the transatlantic slave trade, to read Professor Cooper's book, The Hanging of Angelique, um, because she provides a, a quite a, an, an interesting Canadian-focused history of, um, of the slave trade. So Professor Cooper, I just wanted to thank you so much. We're so lucky to have you doing this work, um, that you're doing this digging, <laughs> that you're telling these stories, and that you're so willing to engage with us and to build alliances and to, to speak with us. Uh, so thank you. It was my pleasure, Tina, and thanks to you all. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Yeah, you too. Thank you, Professor Cooper. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Bye.